As we study our topic this evening titled The Devastating Implications of Futurism, I would like to begin by reading a statement from the book Testimonies for the Church, volume 5 and page 292. Sometimes I come across people who tell me that they don't think that it's really important to study all of these issues relating to Bible prophecy. In fact, as I mentioned in the presentation on Sabbath morning, there was one individual that told me, I don't much care what's coming, all I care is who's coming. And I told him, well, uh, if you don't understand what's coming, you're probably going to accept the wrong who. If it wasn't important for us to know things as they're going to wind down, uh, Christ would not have spent all the time that he did, for example, in Matthew chapter 24, presenting a sequence of signs that would precede the second coming. We wouldn't have in the Bible so much about the time of trouble and the close of probation and the judgment and, uh, and other events unless these events had importance. In fact, the Bible would not even mention the millennium if it wasn't important. Why in the world would God talk to us about the millennium if that takes place after everybody's case has been decided? It must be that even for those who are living in, the, in this world today and those who will be saved in the kingdom, there are important elements to understand about the millennium even though all cases at that point have been decided. Ellen White in this comment tells us the extreme importance of knowing the truth, knowing the truth and the danger of entertaining error. And this is what she says. Error is never harmless. It never sanctifies, but always brings confusion and dissension. It is always dangerous. What is error? It is always dangerous. The enemy has great power over minds that are not thoroughly fortified by prayer and established in Bible truth. Very significant statement. Error is never harmless. She says error is always dangerous. And so when it comes to Bible prophecy, we better make sure that, we not, that we're not entertaining error. We should be certain that we are studying the truth and understanding the truth as it is in Jesus. Now as we begin our study this evening, I want to review the historical sequence of Daniel chapter 7. It, by using the method that I have called the historical flow method. It's also known as historicism. Now you'll be able to answer as I go along. In Daniel chapter 7 we have a lion. What does the lion represent? The lion represents Babylon and the kingdom of Babylon governed from 605 to 539 BC. Then you have a bear. What does the bear represent? The kingdom of Medo-Persia which ruled from 539 to 331 BC. Then we have of course a leopard. What does the leopard represent? It represents the kingdom of Greece which ruled from the year 331 to 168 BC. Then of course we have this dragon beast also known as the nondescript beast because there's no animal in real life that is similar to this one. And what does this fourth dragon beast represent? It represents the kingdom of Rome. And by the way Rome governed from 168 BC to 476 AD. And then of course from this fourth beast come forth from the head how many horns? Ten horns. What do the ten horns represent? The ten kingdoms into which the Roman Empire was divided. It's what today is called Europe or the United States of Europe it's called now. So in other words the ten kingdoms 
represent the nations of Europe that arose after the Roman Empire fell apart or was fragmented. And then of course among the ten horns, and by the way those ten horns are complete in the year 476, 476 AD. When the Roman Empire falls in 476 you have these four kingdoms uh, which take the place of the Roman Empire and ten kingdoms. And then uh, among those ten horns, among those ten kingdoms rises another what? Another little horn. And that little horn represents what system? The little horn represents the Roman Catholic system. The Roman Catholic papacy. We're not talking about individuals in this system. We're talking about the system itself. The organizational structure if you please. And how long did the Roman Catholic papacy govern at least in its first stage? It governed for 1260 days which are really years. And of course the dates for the Roman Catholic papacy in its first stage are 538 to 1798 AD. What happened in 1798? In 1798 a deadly wound was given to this system by France when the Pope Pius VI was taken captive, he was actually deposed from his throne and he was taken captive to France where he died in Valence in the year 1799. It was the intention of Napoleon and the French government to do away with the Roman Catholic Papacy. They didn't quite do that. They didn't do away with the papacy as a religious system. But they did take away from the papacy its civil power. The ability to use the secular power to accomplish its purposes. Now do you have this sequence clearly in mind? Yes? What principle are we applying here? We're applying the method, the historical flow method. It begins, the fulfillment begins in the days when the prophet wrote it flows throughout the course of history culminating up till now what we've studied in 1798. Of course we're going to go beyond that in a few moments when we go to the book of Revelation. Are there any gaps in this sequence? No. One kingdom falls the next one rises. That kingdom falls the next one rises. That kingdom falls the next one rises and so on. In other words there are no gaps. So let me ask you can you know at every stage in history where you are in the flow or the sequence of Bible prophecy? Of course you can. And God intended it that way so that we know exactly where we are and how close we are to the end, to final events. Now I would like to go back to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 and notice what this little horn did. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. We've read this verse before but we want to read it again. It says there, speaking about the little horn, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. Don't forget that. He shall speak great words against the Most High. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And think to change what? Times and laws, or as most versions say, times and the law, in singular. So he will think to change times and laws, and now notice this, they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So how long was this little horn going to be able to speak great words against the Most High, persecute the saints of the Most High, and think that he could change times and the law. How long would he have power to do this? What was his allotted period of time? It was time, times, and the dividing of time. Now how much is that? That's three and a half years. Each year in the Bible the prophetic year has 360 days. So if you have three and a half years times 360 days, how much does that give you? If you multiply you'll discover that the result is 1260. 
So in other words time times and the dividing of time is 1260 days and applying the day, year day principle it's 1260 what? Years. Is that clear in your mind? Now let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And I want to read verse 14. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 14. And you're going to tell me if this is referring to the same historical period as the time of the little horn. It says there, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. What does the woman represent? The woman represents the church. And the woman flees to the wilderness because the serpent wants to destroy her. Now we know that the little horn is an emissary of whom? Is an emissary of the serpent. Because in Daniel it says the little horn did this. In Revelation it says that the serpent wanted the death of the woman. And so we know that the power behind the little horn is whom? The power behind the little horn is none less than Satan. Now let me ask you, is this period the same period of Daniel 7 verse 25? Time times the dividing of time. The same identical period. So it must refer to the same 1260 years. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation 12 verse 17. And let me ask you this question. Is Revelation 12 17 coming after Revelation 12 verse 14 in time? Yes, because Revelation 12 is describing a sequence of events. It begins by talking about a woman who has a child in her womb. The child uh, has not been born yet. The dragon stands next to the woman to devour the child when, when he's going to be born. Who is that child? That child represents Christ. So we find that Revelation 12 begins in the days of Christ. When Christ is born. What empire was governing when Christ was born? Rome. And then of course it moves on to the 1260 days or years. Is that the same period as Daniel chapter 7 verse 25? Absolutely. But now I want you to notice Revelation 12 and verse 17. It speaks about a remnant. A remnant which is going to arise after the 1260 years. And notice what we find there. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. That means he was angry with the woman. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Does this remnant arise after the 1260 years? Absolutely. What two characteristics does this remnant have? First of all it keeps the what? The commandments of God. Now let me ask you this question. Which work of the little horn does that counteract? Daniel 7.25 says that he thought he could change what? The law. But God now raises up a remnant that teaches that you're supposed to what? Keep the commandments of God. And they actually keep the commandments of God. But you notice also in Daniel 7 and verse 25 that the little horn thought that he could change what? The times. Now what does God raise up in the remnant church to correct that point uh, where the little horn thinks he can change the times? God raises up the testimony of Jesus Christ to correct that. Now do you remember what we uh, studied when we dealt with the times? in the book of Daniel and in other, other places of scripture. What does it mean to change the times? It means to change, to attempt to change the order of events, prophetic events that God has established. It means trying to change God's prophetic calendar in other words. So let me ask you, was God going to raise up a people in the end that instead of breaking the commandments of God 
as the little horn says you're supposed to do would actually keep the commandments of God. Absolutely. Would God raise up a people which would correct the problem, the second problem, the change in the times, would God raise up the gift of prophecy in order to show what God's true prophetic calendar is like? Yes. In fact, let's notice what the testimony of Jesus is. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10 identifies what the testimony of Jesus is. We should let Revelation explain Revelation. Notice Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. An angel appears to John and it says here, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the what? The testimony of Jesus. Is that the same expression we found in Revelation 12, 17? Yes. Does the remnant have the testimony of Jesus? Yes. Does Satan hate the testimony of Jesus? Yes he does. And so it says, Thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What is the testimony of Jesus? It is the spirit of prophecy. Now who is it that gives the gift of prophecy? It's the Holy Spirit. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so when it says here that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, it's referring to a gift which the Holy Spirit gives to the remnant church, which is the gift of what? The gift of prophecy. What do you suppose would be the purpose of that gift of prophecy? Does that gift have something to correct? What does it have to correct? It has to correct the change in the times that has been made by the little horn. Are you understanding me? So in other words, God raises up a remnant to correct the two things that the little horn did. And somebody might say, oh come on pastor, that's a stretch. Let me tell you why it's not a stretch. Because in both Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, it speaks about the little horn thinking he can change the times and the law for 1260 years. Right? And we just read in Revelation chapter 12, it speaks about the dragon persecuting the woman for 1260 years, and after that period God raises up a remnant to, who keeps the commandments of God and has the gift of prophecy in its midst. In other words, the purpose of the remnant is to counteract these two aspects of the work of the little horn. Is this clear in your mind? Now it will become clearer and clearer as we go along. Now we need to go to the sequence of powers in Revelation 13. Go with me to Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 and 2. And you tell me if Revelation and Daniel are supposed to be studied together. Obviously they are. It says there in verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And now notice, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now isn't that interesting? What does verse 2 make you think about? It makes you think of Daniel 7. How many beasts did we have in Daniel 7? We had four beasts. How many beasts do we have in Revelation 13 verse 2? How many? We got, actually we got, well we got five technically speaking. But do we have a lion in Daniel 7? Do we have a lion in Revelation 13? Do we have a bear in both? Do we have a leopard in both? Do we have a dragon beast in both? Does the dragon have ten horns in both? Absolutely. But in Daniel, the dragon with the ten horns gives his authority to the little horn. Whereas in Revelation 13, the uh, dragon with ten horns gives his authority to whom? To the beast. So the little horn is the same power as what? The little horn is the same power as the beast. Now my question is this, how long does the beast govern after the dragon with ten horns gives him, as it says in Revelation 13, gives him his power, his seat, and great authority. How long does this beast rule? Go with me to Revelation 13 verse 5. Revelation 13 and verse 5. 
And I want you to notice that he does the same things as the little horn. It says in verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Is that true of the little horn also? Is that what the little horn did? Yes. And uh, let's skip now. Let's skip to verse uh, 7. And then we'll come back to verse 5. It says in verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Is that the same thing we found in Daniel 7 about the little horn? Yes. Now what about the time period? Notice what it says in uh, the last half of verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue how long? Forty-two months. How long did the beast rule after the dragon with ten horns gave him his power? Forty-two months. Now do you think maybe the forty-two months are the same as uh, the 1260 days and the time times and dividing of time? Think perhaps maybe? Of course. We've already shown in verse 2 that you have the same sequence. You have lion, bear, leopard, dragon with ten horns gives this power and authority to the beast. Just like in Daniel 7 you have lion, bear, leopard, dragon, beast with ten horns and gives this power to the little horn. Is the little horn the same as the beast? Yes the beast does the same things as the little horn does. Now if you multiply 42 months times 30 days which each month has, each prophetic month has, how long does that give you? If you do the operation the total is 1260 days. God has given us three ways of checking this time period out. He's expressed it as 1260 days in Revelation 12. He's given the figure as time times and the dividing of time and he also has given this time period as 42 months. Do you see how Daniel and Revelation go together? They dovetail together. They have to be studied together in fact. Now I want you to notice that in Revelation 13 there are two things missing. This is the interesting thing. You remember the little horn. It says that the little horn first of all spoke great words against the Most High, right? It persecuted or wore out the saints of the Most High. It says that it ruled how long? Time, times, and the dividing of time. And it also says that it thought it could change the times and the law. But you know you look at Revelation 13 and in Revelation 13 you find yes the great words against the Most High, we just read it. Also it says that He will persecute the saints of the Most High, that's also in Revelation 13. It also says that He's going to rule for 42 months, that's also in Revelation chapter 13. But the other two aspects the change in the law and the change in the times appear to be absent in Revelation chapter 13. Where did the change in the times and the change in the law go in Revelation 13? They're mentioned in Daniel 7.25 but they're not there in Revelation 13. And so you wonder what's happening here. Well let me tell you what's happening. Let me express it in the form of a question. Do you think the devil is going to want to counteract the work of this remnant that God raised up after the 1260 years to try and impose the change in the law and to try and teach the false prophetic scenario that the little horn created? Do you think so? Do you think the devil is going to take this uh, line down, this idea you know of a remnant who is going to say that we're supposed to keep the, all of the commandments of God not as it's been changed by the little horn and this remnant that has the gift of prophecy to set things straight when it comes to the prophetic calendar is the devil going to work to try and counteract in the end time the work of the remnant? Of course he is. Now the question is how does he do it? He does it in two areas. First of all if you read Revelation 13, the last uh, several verses, actually verses 11 to 18, you're going to find that a second beast, which by the way is the United States, we don't, represents the United States, we don't have time here to prove it. In the series on the three angels, I, I have a whole lecture on the United States in Bible prophecy. I go through all of the characteristics. But that second beast is the United States. And the ironic thing is that this beast helps the first beast recover its power. And this second beast actually forces everyone to receive what? To receive the mark of the beast. 
Now I can read you statements from Roman Catholic sources where they say that the mark of their authority is that they have been able to change the law of God. They say the mark of our authority is the fact that we keep Sunday, the church has changed the day of rest from Sabbath to Sunday. So is the false day of worship which was changed by the little horn going to be imposed by force of law at the end of time? Is the change of the law in other words going to be enforced? Yes, you see in Revelation 13 it doesn't speak about changing the law, it speaks about imposing the mark of the beast. But the change in the law was the change of the rest day. The mark of the beast is the imposition of that rest day when the remnant are proclaiming that we're supposed to keep all of the commandments of God. Now what about the uh, true gift of prophecy in the remnant? We've noticed that the, the gift of prophecy is called the testimony of Jesus. That God is going to have in the remnant church a true prophet who will point out God's correct prophetic scenario. Do you suppose the devil is going to also try and counteract the true gift of prophecy? Of course he is. How is he going to do it? Notice Revelation 16 verse 13. This power, this second power has a very unique name. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13. Notice the name that is given to this power that enforces the mark of the beast in honor of the beast. It says there the following, Revelation 16 and verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the what? Of the false prophet. Wow! By the way, do you know those are the three beasts of Revelation 12 and 13? In Revelation 12 you have a dragon, the dragon that wants to kill the child when the child is born. Revelation 13, 1 through 10, you have the sea beast, the beast that arises from the sea. And then you have a second beast in Revelation 13 that rises from the earth. That beast is called here what? The false prophet. Do you suppose the devil is going to use this power to try and teach his counterfeit prophetic scenario, particularly in the United States of America? Absolutely! That's why he's called the false prophet. So in the end time, what is the battle going to be over? The battle is going to be between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. And the true gift of prophecy and the false gift of prophecy. A true prophetic scenario and a false prophetic scenario. Are you with me or not? In other words the issues are the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those are the two characteristics that the devil hates. Why does the devil hate those two characteristics? Because he hates God's law and because he hates prophecy as it has been taught by God. Are you clear on this point? Now, Satan hates the historical flow method. He hates historicism. And the reason why he hates historicism is because historicism points out in detail how prophecy is going to develop in the future step by step. I mean, what part don't you understand of there's going to be Babylon, then there's going to be Medo-Persia, then there's going to be Greece, then there's going to be the Roman Empire, then Rome is going to be divided into ten kingdoms, then there's going to be a little horn, the beast, who's going to govern 1260 years, he's going to receive a deadly wound in 1798. And for a while he's going to be wounded. But after a period of time he is going to resurrect from his deadly wound. His deadly wound is going to be what? Is going to be healed. And the whole world is going to marvel and wonder after this beast who governed 1260 years, who received a deadly wound in 1798. Let me ask you, does that lay out things quite simply and quite clearly? So who, if this beast is the Roman Catholic Papacy that governed 1260 years, if the wound is going to be healed, the wound of whom is going to be healed? The papacy is going to be healed. Do you know that when the papacy received its deadly wound there wasn't, a, there wasn't a nation in the world that wanted to have any sort of relationship with the Roman Catholic papacy when it received its deadly wound. They kept it at arm's length. 
In fact, I have statements by Roman Catholic theologians where they say that the Roman Catholic Church the last 200 years has been inactive because it cannot use the secular governments of the world to accomplish its purposes. You see the genius of the Roman Catholic system it's a church but the genius is that it is able to use the power of the state it used the powers of Europe to accomplish its purposes. But when France rose against it, the help of the secular power was removed. You remember that I read a statement from Ellen White where she says that if the secular governments today remove their restraint from the papacy, her persecutions would awaken once again? Do you know there's a Roman Catholic theologian that says that in the, in the minority we are a lamb. In equality we are a serpent and in the majority we are a lion. Do you catch the point that he's trying to make? Right now this system is at the serpent stage. Inequality, sly, working underground, gaining the respect and admiration even of Protestant leaders in the world, even secular le leaders of the world. Satan hates historicism because historicism reveals clearly who the Antichrist is, when and where he will arise. Let me ask you, when is he going to arise? After the church is raptured to heaven? No! Is he going to arise in the Middle East? No! Because he comes up from the head of that dragon beast which is Rome. It must be a Roman system. Are you understanding me? So this method points out who the Antichrist is, when he has ruled and will rule, where he is going to arise, what he is going to do, who is going to help him regain his power, the United States of America. Also historicism or the historical flow method gives us a clear picture of the issues that will be involved in the final conflict. Doesn't it? It shows that the issues will be the commandments of God. It will have to do with two different prophetic scenarios, two different points of view concerning how prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Furthermore, the historicist method points out when and where the remnant was going to arise. It would have to be after 1798 in the United States because it says there in the verse immediately before Revelation 12 verse 16 that the earth helped the woman and swallowed the waters of persecution that were spewed out by the dragon after the woman and of course the earth there is a symbol of the territory of the United States and so we know by applying historicism where and when the remnant was going to arise and by the way also what its message and mission was going to be. In other words historicism shows us everything it gives us a clear view of the identity of Antichrist, when he would arise, where he would arise, what he would do, who would help him, also the issues involved, also when and where the remnant would arise, what their message and what their mission would be. And of course the devil doesn't want anybody to know any of these things. And so the devil has done his utmost to try and destroy historicism as a, as a method, the historical flow method as I like to call it. I want to read you uh, some statements that I read once before about historicism. Do you know how many historicist churches there are today? Do you know how many, how many churches in the world interpret prophecy the way that we have uh, done in this seminar? Only one, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Do you know that practically all of the Protestant churches around the time of the Reformation used this method? Lutherans? Presbyterians, the Reformed Church, Methodists, they all use this historical flow method that we've discussed in this seminar. But they've gone astray from their roots. In fact, I like to say that if Martin Luther resurrected today, he would die of a heart attack. If John Calvin resurrected today, he would not recognize the Presbyterian Church because these churches have gone so far astray from their prophetic roots. They're unrecognizable, in fact. Now let me read you a statement from Richard Kyle. This is not a Seventh-day Adventist. He used to be a Plymouth Brethren. He used to be a, a dyed-in-the-wool futurist. He says this, Despite, speaking about the Millerite movement, 
despite its visibility, the Millerite movement had little influence on subsequent end time thinking. Notice, what does he say? The Millerite movement had little influence on subsequent end time thinking. It did however have three long term effects. You know William Miller is the one who predicted that Jesus was going to come October 22, 1844 and it never happened. And so those who had heard his message, most of them got discouraged, they left, there was only a small remnant that restudied the prophecies and discovered that Jesus was not going to come to this earth in 1844, but he was beginning his work of uh, the pre-advent investigative judgment in the heavenly sanctuary in the most holy place. In other words, they were not wrong about the date, they were wrong about the event which was going to take place on that date. He says three results from the Millerite movement. Number one, Miller, Millerism spawned the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and that's true. Number two, it discredited historicist premillennialism, causing it to fade out almost entirely after 1844. And number three, the Millerite fiasco demonstrated the perils of de setting definite dates for Christ's return. For those of you who say, well, how did the Adventist church originate with, with someone who set a date for Christ's coming? Uh, well, that was wrong. Because the Bible says that no one knows the day or the hour. There will be no more dates for the second coming or for any other prophetic event. 1844 was the last date. Now notice also what he says in his book, The Last Days Are Here Again, page 102. He says the great disappointment of 1844 had decimated historicist premillennialism. That's the view that we've been sharing in this seminar. And then he says this, but a futurist premillennialism called dispensationalism soon arrived on the scene. In other words, futurism came on the scene and took the place of historicism. Another scholar, Thomas Ice, also a futurist, a dispensationalist, says this, Historicism, once the dominant view of Protestants from the Reformation until the middle of the last century, and by the way he's writing in 1999, so uh, the last century would be the 1800s. What would be the middle of the 1800s? 1844 approximately, yes. See he knows his history. Historicism, once the dominant view of Protestants from the Reformation until the middle of the last century, appears to exert little attraction as a system of prophetic interpretation to conservative Christians. And then he puts in parentheses, outside of Seventh-day Adventist circles. Then he says this, within evangelicalism, that's conservative Protestantism, during the last 150 years, Futurism has grown to dominate and overcome historicism. So what are the two prophetic scenarios that are in a life and death battle or struggle? Historicism and what? And futurism. And this is historicism's last stand. If it wasn't for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, historicism would totally disappear from the world and the devil would be very very happy. Let me tell you why. Futurism changes the time of the appearance of the Antichrist. What does futurism say? They say the Antichrist is going to arise where? He's going to arise over in the Middle East. But according to Bible prophecy where was the Antichrist going to arise? In Europe, in Rome. Does he change the place? So the devil says, look east! and so the devil works west. Secondly, we find that futurism changes the place for the appearance of the Antichrist. Not only the time, not only projected to the future after the, the church is raptured to heaven, but it also changes the place. Instead of Rome, it's where? Jerusalem. So everybody don't look for the Antichrist anywhere in Europe right now. All of this is future and it's going to be in the Middle East, not in Rome not in the United States. Also futurism changes the manner in which the Antichrist will appear. Because they say he's going to be a blasphemous individual who will hate Christianity and persecute the Jews. He doesn't even claim to be a Christian. You know, 
How many, how many people are going to be fooled by that? I mean, they say that there's going to, the Antichrist is going to sit in the rebuilt Jerusalem temple. He's going to have a big crown with the number 666 on it. How many people is that going to fool? Not very many. Oh, that's the Antichrist. He clearly identified himself by having 666 on his crown. Is that the manner in which the Antichrist is going to appear? Dave Hunt himself says that it's going to be like Judas posing as Christ speaking the words of Christ, manifesting the actions of Christ, but at the same time betraying Christ. So futurism changes the manner in which the Antichrist will appear. They'll expect in one, they're expecting one type of Antichrist when there will appear a different type of Antichrist and they won't be ready because they're expecting the wrong type. Futurism also changes the parties involved in the final conflict. You see they say that the final conflict is going to be in the valley of Megiddo between the Russians and the Arabs and the Chinese coming against literal Israel. And so everybody looks for turmoil in the Middle East, Afghanistan, Iraq. They say, wow, prophecy is being fulfilled. But what they don't realize is that according to the book of Revelation and Daniel the final battle is going to be between two types of Christians. Are you with me or not? It's not going to be unbelievers against believers. It's going to be two different kinds of believers. In other words, it's going to culminate with the same scenario that it began with, with Cain and Abel. The only difference between the, the, the conflict between Cain and Abel and the end time conflict is that at the beginning it involved two individuals, whereas at the end time it's going to involve two worldwide groups. But the issues are the same. Obedience and what? And worship. Will you obey God and do what He said? Will you worship the God the way He has said? Or will you disobey God and worship God the way you wish? Because Cain worshiped the God the way he wished. And both of them professed to serve the true God. Both of them professed to worship the true God. And yet Cain, one worshiper, arose to kill his own brother. That's what's going to happen at the end time. But people can't see it because they're expecting this big political ba battle in the valley of Megiddo. Futurism also blurs the issues in, in the final conflict. I can't tell you how many books I've read where they say that the big battle is going to be for the oil of the Middle East. It is going to be over the oil, but the oil of the Holy Spirit. Not the oil of, of the big corporations. I've heard others say, oh, there's going to be this anti-Semitic war against the Jews. Let me ask you, are those really the issues in the final conflict? No, the issue is worship, whether you will obey God's commandments, and which prophetic scenario you will accept, that of the false prophet or that of the testimony of Jesus, which is God's true prophet. You see how serious this issue is? You're dealing with two competing prophetic scenarios. Is that any surprise, and I'll repeat this again, that Billy Graham calls the Pope the world's foremost moral leader? Think he would call him that if he believed that the Pope was the Antichrist? When I say the Pope I'm speaking about the papacy. Do you think Paul Crouch would say, I'm not protesting anything, I'm deleting the word Protestant from my vocabulary? Do you think Robert Schuller would say that he dreams of the day when the entire Christian world will accept the Pope as its leader? Do you think Jack Van Impey, that white-haired fellow who seems to be a Bible encyclopedia in mentioning biblical references, do you think he would say, speaking about the Pope, wow, what a man! Do you think that Lutherans and Catholics would have signed a joint declaration on righteousness by faith saying that they agree on this issue? Do you think that prominent Protestant leaders and Catholic leaders would have signed evangelicals and Catholics together? Do you think Ralph Reed and Pat Robertson would encourage Protestant, uh, Protestant uh, conservative Protestants that is, to form voting blocks with the Catholics? Do you think our president George Bush would regularly consult the National Council of Catholic Bishops and call the Pope for, to ask his opinion about certain decisions that he has to make in the political issues of this world? If all of these believed 
the biblical scenario about the Antichrist, do you think that they would be doing such a thing? They would be fleeing from this power. They would not be drawing close to this power. Now there's a biblical verse which is the central verse that makes the Seventh-day Adventist church what it is. Daniel 8 verse 14. Unto 2300 days and the sanctuary shall be what? Cleansed. Which sanctuary was going to be cleansed? Obviously there was no earthly sanctuary. It had to be what? The heavenly sanctuary. Now how do we get the date 1844? Do you know how we get the date 1844? Where do the 2300 days begin? It begins in 457 with the 70 weeks. Remember the first part is cut off for the Jews? So the first part of the 2300 days is the what? 490 years allotted for the Jews. Are you following me or not? Now do we believe that it's continuous after the 490 years are finished it continues flowing all the way to 1844? Is there any parenthesis or interruption in any of this uh, 2300 days? No. But what do futurists say? They say that after the first 69 weeks, 483 years, the prophetic clock stops. The last week has not been fulfilled yet. Let me ask you, what does that do to 1844? It obliterates it. Because in order to get to the date 1844, you have to believe that the 70 weeks and the years that come after it are continuous without interruption. Why do you suppose the devil has created that parenthesis? Because he does not want people to understand that in 1844 a very important event began in heaven. And what was it that began? The investigative judgment in which apartment of the sanctuary? the most holy. Revelation 11 19 says that the temple of God was open in heaven and the ark of his testament was seen. That's the most holy place. And you know it's no coincidence that the Seventh-day Adventist pioneers when they came to understand that William Miller was wrong about the event but he was right about the time and their eyes were focused upon the heavenly sanctuary suddenly they started discovering all sorts of truths, the distinctive truths of the Seventh-day Adventist church. For example, they discovered that the law of God is still binding. How would they get that idea? Well, when you go to the most holy place, there is the ark, and inside the ark are the Ten Commandments. They discovered that the Sabbath was God's rest day. Where did they get that idea from? Once again, by looking at the most holy place. In the law of God is found what? The Sabbath commandment. They came to understand that the judgment had begun. See now they understand the judgment. Suddenly they understand the state of the dead. Because they say if the judgment begins in 1844 then nobody went to heaven or to hell when they died. You're not following me are you? They must have been dead until that time began and they're being judged not personally but by their records. Suddenly all of these truths come to view. And of course God raises Ellen White to explain how all of it fits together. December 1844 God raises Ellen White to explain this whole scenario that has been revealed by the most holy place. But the devil doesn't want people to know about 1844. So he creates a gap in this prophecy. Are you understanding me or not? Critically important. Do you know that uh, futurism also obliterates the appearance of the remnant church? You say how's that? According to Revelation chapter 12, the remnant church appears after the 1260 years. Correct? Do we notice that? After the 1260, the earth helps the woman, then the dragon is enraged with the remnant, who keep the commandments of God, have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But let me ask you, if all of this is taking place not historically, but it's going to take place in the future in the Middle East. What happens with the appearance of the remnant church? It is totally obliterated because this does not apply to Christians. It applies to whom? It applies to the Jews after the church is in heaven. Revelation 4 verse 1. I'm reading it, going to read it quickly. It says, After this I looked and behold the door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. 
Do you know that uh, futurists believe that that's re referring to the rapture of the church? I've mentioned it before. In other words, Revelation 4 verse 1, the church is gone. The rest of Revelation applies to the Jews, not to the church. If this is the case, there are serious implications. If the three angels' messages are found in Revelation 14, and that message is being given after the church has been raptured to heaven in Revelation 4, then the central message of the Seventh-day Adventist church has no relevance. Because our mission is to take the three angels' messages to the world. But if those messages are to be proclaimed after the church is in heaven, then we're wasting our time right now. We're fulfilling the wrong mission and the wrong message for the wrong time. Are you with me or not? The devil wants people, you know when you say the Bible says that God will have a people who keep the commandments, they say no, it's the Jews who will keep the commandments. Because the church is gone by then. Do you know that futurists are setting themselves wide open to believe the Antichrist's counterfeit second coming? Matthew 24, 26 and 27, Wherefore if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus comes again, is he going to come all the way down to this earth? Is he going to set up his millennial kingdom? No. Is Satan going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ? Is he going to walk upon the earth? Is he going to say that he's establishing the millennium of peace? Yes. Who's going to be deceived by this? Those who are expecting Jesus to establish his kingdom for a thousand years on earth. Are you understanding the implications of this? There are serious implications to futurism. It totally blows Seventh-day Adventism out of the water and it blows biblical prophecy out of the water. Totally destroys it and dem demolishes it because the devil hates it. Furthermore, futurists will be totally unprepared for the tribulation. Let me ask you, are you going to prepare for something you don't believe you're going to go through? Do you think people in Kansas will prepare for a hurricane? <laughs> Tornadoes maybe, but not for a hurricane. Let me ask you, who prepares for a hurricane? Those who believe they're going to go through it. But those futurists, they say, we're not going to go through the tribulation, that's for the Jews. We're going to be enjoying heaven. And the Jews, being that they haven't suffered enough, are going to suffer even more during that period. They'll be caught during the time of trouble without shelter, without the necessary preparation. Furthermore, futurism gives Christians a false sense of security because they say, well, if you don't make it to heaven at the rapture, you can still make it during the tribulation. And if you don't make it during the tribulation, you can still be saved during the millennium. Am I being accurate or not? Those of you who have been involved in futurism know that it's true. You know, the doctrine of a second chance and a third chance. And it lulls the church into a false security. And the devil knows it. And therefore people will be caught without shelter in this period. Go with me to Revelation chapter 16 very quickly. You're awful quiet tonight. I guess you understand the implications of this, don't you? We're not talking about academic issues. Some people say, oh, come and talk to me about Jesus. Praise the Lord. I, I am talking to you about Jesus. See, you can't talk about Christ without talking about Antichrist, because Antichrist is a counterfeit Christ. If you want to know how Jesus is coming, you're going to have to know how the counterfeit is coming, so you can accept the right Christ with the right teachings in the right place at the right time because the devil deceived the Jews of Christ day how many were expecting Jesus in spite of all of the prophecies that they had he came to his own and his own received him not of course that would never happen before the second coming with God's professed people what makes you think that the church has been vaccinated as compared with the Jewish nation Revelation 16 verse 15 it's at the very heart of the sixth plague now listen to this, I'm going to, tell, I'm, I'm going to say this, this is important. Hal Lindsey, Tim, Tim LaHaye and all these people who believe in futurism, they say that during the, six, during the plagues, 
the church is in heaven. Okay? They say the church is in heaven. It's been raptured. This is only for the people who were left behind. Now notice verse 15. Jesus is speaking and he says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Let me ask you, during the period of the sixth plague, is it possible to have filthy garments and to walk naked and have people see your shame? According to this verse, yes, because Jesus wouldn't warn us about it unless it was possible. But now go with me to Revelation chapter 3 verse 18. Here's where it gets very interesting. Do you know what futurists also say? They say that Revelation chapter th chapters 1 through 3 applies to the church age. Before the church is raptured. So now we're going to read a verse about the church of Laodicea. This is while the church is still on earth. Notice Revelation 3 verse 18. Speaking about the Laodicean church. It says here, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. What does Jesus warn the Laodicean church? Make sure your garments are kept that the shame of your nakedness might not appear. Is that the same thing that's going to happen to some during the sixth plague? Yes? So let me ask you, is the Laodicean church some going to be on earth during this period? Obviously yes. And so Jesus says the real issue is not oil, the real issue is not anti-Semitism, the real issue is how you are clothed with the righteousness of Christ which is manifested in obedience to His law. Let me s briefly say something about 9-11 and then read a couple of comments by Ellen White. Consequences of 9-11. The devil has, the devil was the one who schemed 9-11. And there's more than meets the eye. Number one, because he wanted to bring the United States to global prominence, just like prophecy said, the United States would arise. Secondly, because he wants to direct everyone's eyes to the Middle East for the fulfillment of prophecy. And three, he wants to lead people to be willing to give up their freedoms and to have government exert control in the name of security because in this way eventually he'll be able to restrict and destroy the freedoms of God's people. Allow me to read you two statements in closing from Ellen White. Great Controversy 581 Ellen White says this, God's Word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are only when it is too late to escape the snare. She is, speaking about the papacy, she is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the Word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. Oh come on pastor you're being an alarmist. No I'm not. It's what prophecy teaches. Her deadly wound would be what? Healed. One final quotation. The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be. The apostasy of the latter times. It is part of her policy, that is Rome's policy, to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics nor persons suspected of heresy, she declares. Shall this power whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints be now acknowledged as part of the church of Christ? asks Ellen White. It is not without reason, now notice this, it is not without reason that the claim has been put forth in Protestant countries that Catholicism differs less widely from Protestantism than in former times. 
there has been a change. But the change is not in the papacy. Catholicism indeed resembles much of the Protestantism that now exists because Protestantism has so greatly degenerated since the days of the reformers. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity has blinded their eyes. By the way the expression false charity today would be political correctness. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity has blinded their eyes. They do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil, and as the inevitable, inevitable result they will finally believe evil of all good. Instead of standing in defense of the faith once delivered to the saints, they are now as it were apologizing to Rome for their uncharitable opinion of her, begging pardon for their bigotry. Amazing, but true. Folks, the Lord has given a marvelous message to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Present truth for these last days. The world needs to know these things, because the world is confused. Millions upon millions of Christians and non-Christians have read the Left Behind series, and they're convinced that this is the gospel truth, the way it's going to happen. Futurism has overtaken the world as a false system of interpreting prophecy. It behooves us as Seventh-day Adventists to go onto our rooftops and to holler to the world that there's another alternative which the devil has hidden, which the devil has sought to destroy, so that when these events explode upon the world scene, people can make wise decisions and choose to be with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for showing us the importance of all of these things. Oh, Father, there's so many of your children out there in the various churches, even in the Roman Catholic Communion, thousands upon thousands that love you. They're sincere. Oh, Father, in some way I ask that you will help us or someone to find these people and to share your message with them. Father, we believe that we're winding down in the history of the world to the final events, the very close of time. We want to be ready and we want to prepare others. So Lord, help us to stand firm for the truth which was once delivered to the saints. Help us not to give an inch when it comes to principle. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of prayer and for hearing us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.